Joining me today is Helen Thomas, who for many, many years was dean of the White House uh, Press Corps, uh, uh, working at that time for United Press International. Uh, she is now a columnist for uh, Hearst Publications and a damn good one. And Thank the you. interesting thing is that uh, I always thought of the Hearst group as being very conservative, but she has brought a <laughs> breath of liberalism to uh, the, the Hearst uh, family. And the date is September the 11th, the notorious September the 11th. Um, and Helen, as I had told you, we, what we're now doing is trying to build a, um, uh, a whole body of, of uh, video recollections and reminiscences of Lyndon Johnson and Lady Bird. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you might, uh, I don't know what, what you have in mind, but you might start out by talking about, if you remember, the first time you ever saw him. Well, the first time I ever saw him was when I interviewed him as a member of the House Naval Affairs Committee, so it was when he was a congressman. And later on as a senator, I must say that he was very supportive of uh, women's reporters and the Women's National Press Club. At that time, we couldn't get into the National Press Club, so we had a very active women's press club. And uh, I think uh, at the behest of Liz Carpenter and maybe even Sarah McClendon, the two Texas women, news women, uh, he got very uh, supportive of us. Uh, showed up at a lot of our functions, social functions, and so forth. So LBJ was very much in the picture for me from the 50s on. And um, then he, when he became Senate Majority Leader in the 50s, I was very, watching very closely when he helped uh, Eisenhower get the first Civil Rights Act through. We thought it was 57, I think, and it was very watered down. But at the same time, we knew that there wouldn't have been any Civil Rights Act if, if it had been left to Eisenhower, who didn't even want to send troops to Little Rock to desegregate. So I had a, a, certainly an impression of him as a, a man of, of compassion. That never left me. I think that he really cared about people. At the same time, he was very man manipulative, if I can pronounce the word, in terms of uh, the lawmakers. He knew where all the bodies were buried. He knew every man's price. And as a consequence, that served him in good stead, I think, to get a lot of legislation through that never would have passed. So um, we thought of, I thought of him as an operator, but a very effective one and for a lot of the right causes. And you covered him all through the White House years, didn't you? Yes. And uh, I think I could speak for any reporter in the terms that he probably is the most colorful president we ever covered. I mean, he was totally unpredictable and yet predictable in a way. And um, very impromptu, uh, acting on impulse, but good impulses, but really had a big heart in a sense. and. Um, um, I really think that he always wanted to do the right thing. He coveted the presidency, and when he took over, he was the right man to step into the shoes after the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, did you... Uh, uh... Oh, just one other point I wanted to really stress is that no reporter in Washington or whoever covered the White House has ever had as much access to a president where you could walk down the street with him. Two or three times uh, he invited me into his limousine to take a ride to a certain place where he was going to speak and maybe the, my AP competitor also. I mean, I can assure you that never happened before and has never happened since. Uh, uh, was that the only time you had a one-on-one -on -one with him or if you, uh, did that happen again? Oh. Well, usually wire services, and I worked for UPI at that time, would, would be invited in together. And uh, many times it was, uh, he would designate the session as off the record. At the same time you knew that he wanted you to get the word out. Um, Carl Bauman of the AP and myself, shortly after President Johnson became president, were covering uh, the president at church at, I think it was uh, Fredericksburg or one of the places that we made the rounds, three, three church services on Sunday. 
but he invited us to the ranch. And he really invited us so that we could fire the whole cabinet, the Kennedy cabinet, and <laughs> say that, uh, you know, the president was uh, looking for the resignations, which was very pro forma, on his desk from the cabinet to the Kennedy cabinet. But he didn't want us to have a Texas date line, and he didn't want to say what our source was. And we did so we really fired the whole cabinet from, from Washington. We knew it was authentic, you know, and so forth. But I've always had a little bit of qualms about that. <laughs> How deceptive can you get? At the same time, he called the called Secretary Dean of State Dean Rusk. This doesn't mean you. When you read this story, it doesn't mean you. And the same thing with McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense. So he separated them out and assured them that this story only meant certain cabinet officers. I don't know, the games we play. <laughs> how, many, how many presidents altogether have you covered? Well, the nine. How would you rate Johnson among those nine? A giant on domestic affairs, probably the most effective on the domestic side, the Great Society, which was the greatest contrib contribution to social welfare in the last 50 years of the 20th century, where Roosevelt, I consider, was a tremendous leader through the Great Depression, World War II, and also reforming our society in terms of trying to bring in regulation of the stock market and the banks giving us some sort of a cushion uh, that we would not have that kind of debacle again. So, uh, and then, you know, we had heart then and we don't have it now. You, uh, you disagreed with Johnson on one major, poli major policy. Right, I hated the Vietnam War from the 40s, because I truly believed during World War II, I believed Churchill and I believed FDR, when they really told the colonial areas, you support us in this war against the great, against Hitler and so forth, and we will uh, help you reach your uh, nationalistic aims. Instead, after World War II, we allowed the British and the French to reoccupy all these colonial areas, including Indochina at the time of Dien Bien Phu. I mean, it was certainly a debacle. Um, I was covering, I was covering, I was doing, filing a wire in Washington when Vice President then, Richard Nixon, and some of the top generals and admirals got together at Blair House, and uh, Nixon proposed dropping the atomic bomb to help the, uh, the nuclear bomb to help the French at Dien Bien Phu when they were so beleaguered, and fortunately, Eisenhower put his foot down. But I thought, this is horrible. Then there was peace, yeah, because the French withdrew, they were defeated, and uh, the, the West wasn't going to tolerate that. Eisenhower had promised uh, Cardinal Spellman, I'm really, you know, uh, kaleidoscoping a very important phase of history, but in effect, we promised the South Vietnamese that we would protect their sovereignty and so forth, and that was the start of getting involved in, in the Vietnam War. I thought Ho Chi Minh, we should have helped him with his nationalistic aims during World War II. He, he wrote to FDR many times, begging for support for his movement, and uh, also to Churchill, and when he was rejected, uh, he went to Moscow for help and, and became a solid, I guess, communist. So, so many, there were so many it might have been, but I never thought that we should go in and pick up the pieces, especially when, when the French and uh, the Chinese and the Vietnamese were in Geneva to sign this peace agreement, and John Foster Dulles was there representing the United States. He refused to shake hands with the Chinese, and we refused to really accept that peace agreement. And then we started to pick up the pieces, thinking there was a vacuum there, that we had to support this, and then developed the, the domino theory that if you let Vietnam go, then Cambodia will go, and Laos, and everything else. And so everything, 
I mean, it's a whole kaleidoscope, as I say, of, of mistakes, but I, th I thought it was wrong for us to go into Vietnam. I certainly thought it was wrong for Kennedy to send military advisors. And then when the President Johnson promised in 1964 that he was not going to send American boys to do the jobs that the Asian boys should do, I'm paraphrasing, but basically people thought, well, Goldwater is the hawk. I mean, he's going to lob one into the men's room in the Kremlin, and he's going to push the button, start World War III. Well, it turned out that Johnson apparently had a plan to go into Vietnam and to really build up the structure. But I think he was always told by the generals and by even the, our great pundits that this is a war that could be won easily. I, I, I think it was just so horrendous for me because I could see that it was wrong, 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 unless you dropped the big bomb. There was no way because it reminded me of a cartoon in, from the Korean War, New Yorker cartoon, G.I. Joe looking very muddied, sticking his head up from the foxhole with his pal. He's tasking his pal, how do you tell a South Korean from a North Korean? And this is what I felt, that the Vietnamese, had, Viet Cong, had so infiltrated Oh, they worked in the offices in Saigon and so forth. There was no way t to to win this war unless you were really the scorched earth. So I was in real pain that, for our involvement because I not only thought it was wrong to be there, I also thought of the terrible price that you couldn't win really unless you was an all-out assault, and, and gradually the American people began to feel that it was a uh, no-win no proposition, and, and they hit the streets, and they hit the bricks, and uh, they took down the, the Johnson presidency, and it had done so, so much good, but there's no question that Vietnam, as he told Walter Cronkite at, after he left the White House, President Johnson told Walter Cronkite in the first interview he gave as a past president that it was the Vietnam War coming into everyone's living room every night that really hurt his presidency the most. <coughs> uh, since you covered uh, LBJ throughout the whole five years of his administration, you had some contact with each one of his press secretaries. How would you uh, give us a, a, uh, give us a feeling about how you worked with them and how you what do you thought what do you thought about all of them? Well, I thought that uh, he had no real rapport with Pierre, Pierre Salinger, who was uh, that he the press secretary and he inherited. So that was soon <laughs> demolished. I don't first place. I didn't think that Johnson could tolerate any press secretary because he didn't like anyone speaking for him. <laughs> but he did, I think, he had the best relationship with George Christian. I think they were on the same wavelength and uh, George Christian understood him, he was a Texan and so forth. But uh, then George Reedy. Reedy was the first, he, he had been a UPI reporter and he covered the house when Johnson was a uh, congressman. And he really became, came to admire Johnson so, so much for his, the power of his personality and what he was trying to accomplish. And uh, Reedy was the first person who ever told me that Lyndon Johnson was going to become president. And I laughed in his face because I didn't, didn't think that was possible considering the stories we had heard about Johnson and so forth. And he was very devoted to Johnson. But, and he was first on board uh, when, when Johnson became president. But when he became his press secretary, really buckled under those phone calls from POTUS, the president of the United States, when Reedy would be um, briefing us in his office, all of a sudden the phone would ring and we could see him shaking. I mean, his, his pipe and so forth, because we knew he was going to get the riot act because Johnson apparently was listening in to the, to the whole briefing and why are they asking that and so forth. And so I think that, uh, and J 
No, I don't think that Johnson ever really felt that any press secretary was adequate, but uh, one thing, he was never vindictive. When he got rid of a press secretary, he, they usually got better jobs at the behest of Johnson, who took care of everybody in terms of, well, uh, what he did to uh, Jack Valenti wasn't, wasn't press secretary, but he insured him a lifetime multi-million dollar job with the American Motion Picture Association. Uh, he helped really, as he was easing him out for hammer toes or whatever, to become um, spokesman for one of the unions, labor. And uh, in terms of Bill Moyers, he got rid of him, uh, making, helped make him publisher of Newsday. And then there were a couple of others, but uh, so he treated everybody well as he wanted to get rid of them. Um, he made sure they didn't land in the streets. Joe Layton was one that was never quite press secretary, but he was acting press secretary. Right. Uh, 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 Liz Carpenter was never his press secretary, but you developed a, a, a kind of a rapport with Liz, didn't you? Uh, oh, me? Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, well, I knew her from the... Uh, days from the 40s when we were both knocking on doors at the National Press Building trying to become reporters in Washington. So, And we both got jobs because they were drafting every young man in World War II who, had a, who could breathe. If he had a pulse, he was going to war. And suddenly some slots opened up for women. They had to hire us. How about... Uh, how on the newspapers. How about your uh, uh, reminiscences about Lady Bird? Well, I think that she's probably the the greatest press uh, first lady I ever covered because she had really great goals for the country. I think she transformed this land that we love. And you cannot go to Washington spring or fall or any other time when you don't see the plantings, the belief in our country, the environment, and so forth. I think she planted the seeds. I went to the first Head Start classes with her where we learned that these poverty-stricken kids, some of them had never seen a book before, never seen a chair before. I mean, they edu she educated us. And I'm not the outdoor girl, but I climbed every mountain, forded every stream with her, <laughs> much to my distress. We all wound up you know, going down the Snake River, riding the rapids, and me, I don't swim even. <laughs> and there's a photograph of all of us in these rubber uh, uh, rafts uh, going down the Snake River, and it's in Sports Illustrated. And the most miserable looking person on the raft was me. <laughs> she was, she's wonderful. And I think the fact that she's always continued in her her work for the beautification of the country and all the right causes never ended, even after she left the White House. Were you at the LBJ Ranch many times? Several times. Sometimes against my will, but no. I mean, Johnson liked people, and he was a people person. Sometimes reporters became people when we were the only ones around that he could buttonhole and pour out his troubles to, which was great because we really had a feeling of what this president was thinking about. There were a lot of stories uh, at the time about his um, uh, taking some reporters on a wild ride through the ranch. and uh, uh, Looking in the eyes of the deer. And, and, uh, but, uh, and tossing beer cans out. I, I, I've always wondered if those were true or not. Are they? Well, the reporters who were on that ride, the famous ride early on in his administration, uh, claim it is true. I, I rode on uh, some of those uh, twilight rides uh, over the ranch, and, and what was great is he'd pour me some scotch in a paper cup, and we never threw it out. <laughs> It was all off the record. Said, oh, yes, sir, and gulp. <laughs> uh, where, um, uh, where did you, when, when, in the times that you were there, 
Uh, where did the press stay, in Austin or in San Antonio? Or in we Toronto? stayed in Austin till we got too many stories about people who knew Johnson and got too close to some of the people who knew him in the good old days. So he decided to move us to San Antonio. And uh, we stayed at the Driscoll Hotel and had a wonderful time in uh, in Austin because the Headliners Club was there. We would gather there, and Johnson always <laughs> knew where we were. And uh, when we went to San Antonio, we were not as comfortable, and uh, we stayed in a flea bag, and it was not. I think he was just as happy to keep us further away. Did he ever? Uh personally berate you for any any story? I, I was uh, in the deep freeze for a few months when I wrote that Lucy Johnson was engaged to Pat Nugent and I mean <laughs> to scoop the President of the United States on his own family matter was not exactly to his liking. Well tell us about that. How did you get that scoop? Uh, well I got it through sources in, in Austin and um, it came from some of her girlfriends gossiping and so forth. But uh, Johnson was very unhappy, and uh, he had his press secretaries. They didn't deny anything, but what they what uh, it was Moyer's brother who had to face the music um, after I'd written the story. And then they said, he said, President Johnson says. Someday, when his daughter is engaged, he will announce it and so forth. But he, there was no outright denial, so I was out there on a limb. But uh, I began to look golden as time went on. <laughs> uh, did you? He, I, I'm sure that he was. Uh, he used to. Uh, I mean, he felt personally every question that was asked and. He used to read the transcripts from our briefings, which no president has ever bothered to do. And then he would have a, se a secretary from the press uh, office write down the names of who was asking the questions. And then he'd go into high dudgeon. He'd usually read the transcripts at lunch, and that would give him indigestion. <laughs> so, but, oh, that person, that reporter. He was a human being <laughs> reacting. Uh, did you attend both of the girls' weddings? Yes. As a guest, or did you cover? I covered. No, not a guest. <laughs> Maybe an unwanted uh, reporter. <laughs> but and you wrote about them both. Yes. Um, I always felt like uh, Johnson was listening in on conversations. We always had this sense of big brother. I mean, he really did care about what the reporters were saying and thinking. Uh, those uh, Bataan death marches around the South Lawn started out with George Reedy and so forth, who couldn't quite do the walk with his toes. He'd sort of wait, and one time we'd pass him round and round. And, and the LBJ was very sadistic on this because he'd speak in a whisper, and we're all falling over each other trying to find, what did he say, what did he say? And we'd pile back into the press room and then try to compare our notes, and then he would have said, it's all off the record. And we knew he didn't really want it off the record, but he didn't want it attributed to him. So trying to sort that stuff out it was, uh, and yet we gained a lot of information from him because we, he was really letting his hair down on those walks, especially when he was anguished about Vietnam. The, uh, the telephone tapes that we have been releasing, um, uh, I have been asked if I was surprised at anything in them, and, and I was when I heard, because I wasn't I wasn't working for him as early as as uh, as as, uh, as 64, but uh, when I heard those early conversations between him and uh, uh, Senator Russell and uh, and Mac Bundy, in which he was agonizing over the fact that he was being pulled into the war, or that not that he was being pulled, but circumstances were driving. Him. Right. I didn't realize until then the depth of his feeling about it. Did they come as a surprise to you? To know that he was that unhappy, that anguished early on? Mm. 
what made me, it, I mean, I wanted him to follow Senator Aiken of Vermont's advice, declare a victory and leave. You know, unless you were going to take, go for the big jump, which was the bomb, or, or dry, bomb them back to the caveman's, you know, it was just, uh, and more and more you could see how, how uh, distressed he was, and yet he couldn't quite bite the bullet, of which was just leave. That's what, what uh, Reagan did in, in Lebanon. He silently slipped away on a weekend, and everybody was very happy and relieved. And I do think that if President Johnson had pulled out of Vietnam, um, that he would have uh, certainly been reelected and I certainly believe that the country would have been relieved, but he, he couldn't quite do that, and he wrestled over the, with this problem, and I think it destroyed him in the sense. When, not only him, but Nixon, who made false promises in 1968 that he had a plan to end the war. Four and a half years later, in the Nixon administration, the first term, he was still bombing hell out of Hanoi. And uh, so there was betrayal, and American people began to fee feel that, it, certainly in terms of the Nixon promise. And Johnson became an, a prisoner in the White House in the sense that hundreds of people, men, women, children, mostly women and children, were marching in front of the White House. And uh, at that time it was allowed. Now it wouldn't be in terms of security. and. <laughs> candlelight vigils and something, nothing violent, and, and you were never afraid. But at the same time, the protests grew and grew and grew every, he couldn't go anywhere at what, at the final point, but uh, aircraft carriers and, and army bases and so forth, that it was only the military where he would be received properly. So um, I think it was a very, very tragic time that he realized that president was became caged and the same thing happened to Nixon where they were really they made big mistakes in policy which went split the country i don't think we've ever recovered from vietnam and um i've never seen the country so divided world war 2 was different there was true unity the American people realized we had to go to the war, that we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, and uh, there were very few dissenters, if any. Up Leading up to that war, yes, there were in interventionists and non-interventionists. Of course, the Pearl Harbor attack, everybody was solidly behind the war, except for the true conscientious objectors who had religious uh, 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 qualms or whatever, not to not to go to war, and some of them became medics who were unarmed. But uh, you you had a different feeling about that war. We were all in it together. It was worth any sacrifice. In terms of Vietnam, I mean, the country really, really turned off. Was turned off, and they realized that it was not worth the candle. Back to the ranch. Uh, did you uh, ever uh, uh, meet uh, the president's cousin Oriole? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I loved her. She was really a wise woman. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, I think she real that he, President Johnson loved her. I mean, I think he went to her for soul renewal. He would uh, take the reporters down to her uh, cabin or house. Uh, which was on the ranch, and uh, we would chat with her a while. One night we knocked on her door, I've written about this, and uh, she, it was about nine o'clock or a little later, and uh, she came to the door bare, f and bare feet and so forth, and, and uh, we, we met her and liked her very much. But I wrote this piece about Johnson taking us to her ramshackle house, and uh, that she came bare, barefoot to the door to greet us and so forth. And she later, when she read the story, she was 
in high dudgeon. She said, does Helen Thomas go to sleep with her shoes on? But I did get a new paint job for her house. Johnson wrote me a note how, how offended he was and so forth, but he said, as a consequence, I'm, I'm going to help the Cousin Oriel to have a new house. And a, so I thought I did some good with my destructive story. <laughs> Uh, Helen, uh, before we uh, leave this, uh, something about uh, you personally. Uh, you, after all those years uh, in the front lines, uh, you're now, uh, uh, you've got a cushy job as a columnist. Uh, uh, oh, very cushy. <laughs> it's <laughs> painful. <laughs> do you miss uh, do, you, do you miss being in the uh, in the in the thick of it in the White House? Press I do go to the briefings. I still go every day when I'm in Washington, and uh, I still tilt with the press secretaries. But I think it's very important. Uh, I think that the reporters now are not as uh, pushy, inquiring. Determined. I mean, they really, really rolled over with 9/11, and I think they've played dead too long, uh, fearful that they would be called unpatriotic. These briefings at the White House are televised, so the whole idea is your bosses are watching. So don't ask questions that might rock the boat, and the American people won't like it because they think you're jeopardizing the troops wherever they are. So as a consequence, I think that you don't have the same hard-driving questions which have to be asked. So I consider myself the remnant of uh, the past and to, I think we, the questions should be asked and uh, they're getting away with a lot because they should be questioned. The very fact that you have a president of the United States who has never asked why, who doesn't want an investigation of what is terrorism, what is the cause of it, what are they aiming for? Why? And so forth. I mean, World War II, we had the Pearl Harbor investigation, I'll grant you afterwards, but you certainly have to get to root causes, and you have an administration that really doesn't want you to know anything. They're, they're even polygraphing, giving lie detectors to uh, members on the Hill who learned that the National Security Agency had big warnings on September 10th that something was about to happen and so forth. And uh, they delayed translating these messages for two days. And meanwhile, we had the debacle. Well, we're not supposed to know that. I think we should know much more, almost everything. I mean, the truth won't hurt us, but lies do. That's a very uh, good ending piece. Helen, thank you very much. <laughs> yes. You're very welcome. Useful, right? yes, it is.